Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and on today's episode, I talk to the ambassador of strange Florida tales, Mia Lorenzo. Mia is a native Floridian, a seasoned storyteller, and according to her, a weirdo to the core. She's a 36-year veteran of public television in Miami. Her experiences include producing series, special events, and historical documentaries. She's the recipient of four regional Suncoast Emmy Awards and has a passion for telling Florida stories on her podcast, The So Flow Weird Show. The book Mia chose to talk to me about today is the nonfiction account of three men walking the length of the state of Florida. You heard that correctly, and yes, it is just as bananas as you think it is. I had a blast talking to Mia about why In the Land of Good Living by Kent Russell is the best book ever. Whether they read a book a day or a book a year, I love asking people to tell me about their favorite books. And that includes you, dear listener. What's your all-time favorite? Your desert island classic? What about the childhood favorite that you still know by heart? The mystery that took you by surprise? The biography that changed your way of thinking? Or the book club favorite that you can't stop thinking about? I'm looking for guests from all walks of life to talk to me about all kinds of books here on the show. Go to my website, juliewroteabook.com, and click on the button that says, Be a Guest on the Best Book Ever. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Now, back to the show. Hi, Mia. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mia, I'm so fascinated by your podcast and the work that you do exposing the wonderful weirdness of Florida. Can you tell me why you decided to start this podcast, the SoFlo Weird Show? My roots are in television. I'm a 36-year veteran of public media here in Miami at a station called WLRN. And I did two successful like travel documentaries called Weird Florida, Roads Less Traveled and Weird Florida on the Road Again. It started ultimately with a book called Weird Florida. Um, actually, how it all started, I, you know, back when there were bookstores, I went to a bar. I used to love to get coffee and go to a Barnes and Noble. And in this particular Barnes and Noble, they had a section of, of Florida authors and Florida books and always on the hunt for a good story. I would go there and look. And when I saw this book called Weird Florida, just some sort of force or light bulb went off in my head. And I went, wow, wouldn't that be really, really cool if I could get paid and go travel the state of Florida doing this stuff? So when I looked at the back cover and I saw the author who was Charlie Carlson and he was dressed all in black and he just looked like a really cool character. He had this thick mustache and this black cowboy hat and this, you know, black vest and black jacket. I thought, oh, man, this guy's really, really cool. If he can walk, talk, chew gum and <laughs> interview people, then I have got it made. So I pitched the idea to our television station and tried to run a test with him. You know, I kind of had to sell him on the idea. Like I, I called him up and I was like, has anybody ever done a television show with you or wanted to take your book and take it on the road? He says, well, a lot of people have offered, but nobody's followed through. And I said, well, Mr. Carlson, if it's one thing I do, I follow through. <laughs> so I went and met him and just fell in love with him, immediately fell in love with his dog. So I wanted to make the dog the co-host. And I brought him down. He's actually from Central Florida. I brought him down to do a test shoot here at a place called Coral Castle, uh, which is a really cool story in and of itself. And I put him in all these different situations where he would walk and talk. He would do a stand up. He would do an interview with the person who does tours there. And then he would find a tourist for me to do an on the spot interview. So anyway, we got the go ahead to do it and it was really, really successful. It was distributed uh, uh, nationally to other PBS stations across the United States. You know, it was very, very successful. All the while, um, I had to bring him down here a few times. My mother met him and long story short, they wind up dating and they <laughs> wind up getting married. Oh my God. <laughs> so what started out as a business venture turned into family. Okay. <laughs> so we successfully do another um, weird Florida on the road again. 
a few years later. And um, at this point, Charlie got sick. Charlie has multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the blood plasma or blood cells. There's really no cure for it. And as he was going through treatment and everything, my mother thought, you know what? She's looking on Amazon. She sees a little podcast kit. She says, because every day, no matter how Charlie felt, he would, he would go to the computer and write stories or thoughts or whatever. And she thought, well, you know, maybe if I can get him to do a podcast, he doesn't need to expend the energy of traveling and doing this, that, and the other, but he could still get his stories out there. Well, sadly, that didn't happen. And Charlie wound up passing away. And sort of to pay some kind of, you know, respect to Charlie and keep his name out there. This podcast, the SoFlo Weird Show podcast, is a little bit of an offshoot of Weird Florida. And it's really to honor him. He's he's definitely a character. He's a lot of fun. He's a 10th generation folk historian. Oh, my gosh. Um, and and he yeah, he, he ran away with the circus. He he was 27 years in the army, but he hated the army. Um, he didn't hate it. It was just sort of a job at that point, you know? Um, uh-huh. and he was just, he was, he was really, really, really wonderful and a, and a fantastic storyteller. Charlie is a historian first and foremost, and he had written several history books that didn't nearly sell as much as when he would put a weird spin on it. Charlie was still telling Florida history, but he was tying it up and packaging it with a a bow on top under the guise of weird. And all of a sudden now he sells like over a million copies. You know what I I mean? Uh huh. So it, it was a way about, you know, learning history. Now in truth, my roots with WLRN, our tagline is South Florida storyteller station. So the station in and of itself has branded itself as, you know, telling Florida stories with a national interest. So I was always on the hunt for Florida stories. And the thing I learned about weird Florida, the minute I got in the car and we got on the road and we did this 1500 mile venture through Florida with him and his dog is that the first huge takeaway was once I leave my overpopulated, ridiculous South Florida area where everybody's on top of everybody There's so much vast space out there and Florida is so diverse and so different. That was a huge eye opener for me. I was living in this little bubble in South Florida, you know, and, 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 and to, and to explore it in all its weirdness has been just a wonderful journey. I was never really aware of the distinct regions of Florida. And, and I, I don't know if this is just because I'm on the opposite coast of you or if maybe this is sort of the general American perception of Florida. But I always think of Florida as Miami Beach, Disney World and the rest of Florida. And (laughs) (laughs) and you are not alone. You are not alone. (laughs) Yeah. And you really get this sense in the book of the regional differences and the regional pride and how. I mean, it's they're almost like different states, these different counties within Florida, aren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they look completely different. Absolutely. Completely different. You could be in the panhandle. You can be in in central Florida. You you know, it's 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 completely different wherever you go. We are both a red state and a blue state. We have two different time zones. That was another eye opener. You know, I was like, what do you mean we're in a different time zone? You go in that panhandle and you're like, you know, on Alabama time over there because you're literally South Alabama at that point. But yes, it is. It is a completely different landscape. And and I love it because it's stories within stories. You know, obviously, Kent Russell, who's the author of um, In the Land of Good Living, went out there and did it all on foot. And when you experience something like that, you experiencing you experience it on a whole nother level. Yeah. So how did you come across this book? I came across this book by Kent because we have a fantastic uh, event here every November in Miami called the Miami International Book Fair. They get the best of the best people in there. And and the minute I read the description, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is the quintessential weirdo. I love him. And again, (laughs) I like to connect with the author. Obviously, when you're looking at a book, you're either looking at the, um, you know, 
at the cover art. Then you read the description. I also like to connect with the author, just like I did with the Weird Florida book. I flipped it over and I wanted to see what Charlie looked like. And when I saw this guy's picture and he's got this, he's he's like rocking a mullet, you know, and, he, and just just the look of him. And I'm like, oh, this guy is fantastic. I loved it. And I love the way he crafted it um, because I also look at the art of the book, how a person puts it together, you know. <laughs> So why don't you describe what this book is about for our listeners who haven't come across this? Kent Russell got this wacky idea with his friend that they would take this pedestrian journey through Florida. It's like a thousand mile journey. I think they were drinking one night, watching TV, (laughs) kind of down and out. You know, they're like at a crossroads in their life, him and his friend, you know, not really happy where they're at. And they were just kind of trying to think of a project or something to do. And taking from the book of an old, older Florida politician, uh, uh, governor here in Florida, Lawton Childs, who was a little known candidate running for governor. And what he what Lawton Childs did was he decided to walk through the state of Florida this way he could get to know people. And really be able to connect with people by saying he really knows Florida because. You know, he's walked in their shoes So they kind of took the idea of that and, you know, it didn't happen quite right away. I think it happened a little further down the line. And then they connected with another friend who thought that they would make a documentary out of it. So they decided to start like at the, at the state line and they just walked all through Florida and the things that they uncovered and the people that they met along the way really proves how diverse this state is. And what I really loved about the book too, is that it's written like a history book, yet it's written like a novel. And yet it's written like an actual screenplay where he describes the scene, you know, mile marker, Mm -hmm. this exterior daytime, you know, shopping cart in, in, in shopping plaza, you know, and, and just, I, I found it to be just delightful to read because it had these multi layers of, of different ways of storytelling all within the book, but yet they flowed perfectly. And some of the characters they meet and the dangers they run across, you know, they're getting runoff properties. They're, they're, they're looking at the barrel of a, you know, shotgun from some people. They were camping out on the sides of the road. They nearly got hit by oncoming cars because we are not a pedestrian state whatsoever. And anybody that's ever been in Florida knows we drive we drive awful. We're probably, <laughs> I, I haven't looked at a list anywhere, but I think if you probably look at a list like worst places to drive, I'm sure we're on there somewhere. We're just, we're just bad. We're bad drivers. <laughs> but, you know, I love, I loved Kent's style of, of storytelling because in one sense, he's describing the scene and what's happening and the characters in it. But then somewhere along the le- you know somewhere along his path they become part of the story as well mm. he's talking about his relationship with these with these two other guys where they're sleeping in the same tent they're sleeping eating living together and obviously that can get ridiculously tense and they did this for like 4 months and documented it all and and it's just it's a wonderful book that really gives you a true sense of what Florida really is. And it gives you a wonderful background and history to it as well. And I love it because it's got that weird angle, which just ties everything back into, into what I love. Going into it, I thought it's going to be one of two things. It's going to be an absolutely scathing mockery of the craziness (laughs) of Florida, or it's going to be this romantic, like, and then the sun set and we learn that the real gift was our friends all along. <laughs> and, you know, and what was amazing about this book is it's sort of both and neither. You know, I, I thought he had such a great eye for Florida, both the craziness of it and also the beauty of it. And I was just so impressed that it was so clear eyed about what he was really seeing and it managed to avoid sort of sentimentality, but it also was not cruel. It was like, (laughs) even when he was talking, it was, it was, it was very raw and it was very real. And yes, Yes. it was, it was very raw and real. Um, I, 
that probably goes back to his, um, you know, whole journalistic background, not just as a as an author, but like his journalistic background where you, you know, investigate stories and you and you look for things like that. He, he just. Um, yeah. And he doesn't also seem the type because I interviewed him for the podcast. He doesn't seem the type to be that sentimental. He describes himself as a loner, you know, um, which is funny because he's living with these two other guys <laughs> for months on the road. Right. You know, and I know things got tense. I think there was a fist fight in there somewhere mm -hmm. um, in the book, but you know, I, you know, it wasn't about his personal journey to find himself or to do anything like that. It was about really his love of Florida and wanting to document it as well. That was my one regret from this book is that there weren't the copy that I had, there were no pictures. And I, I was, exactly. I really wanted to see what they looked like out on the road because they must have made a picture. For a while, they were pushing a shopping cart. They put all their camera equipment into a shopping cart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rolling Thunder. And he had, and he had names for each one. Yes. Rolling Thunder. I forget what the second one was. Baby. No, I think the last one was like Baby, Baby by Thunder. I don't know because he winds up getting a a baby carriage off of Craigslist, but yeah, he, 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 um, he's very descriptive. He's, 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 I just, I love his writing. I'm obviously going to pick up more of his books and his sister's book. His sister's an author too, who does Florida I know, stories. Swamplandia. Yeah. I couldn't yes. believe it when I found that that's what a talented family. I know, I know. Right. And it's all Florida, which is perfect. Do you, um, really lean toward Florida authors and Florida story, Florida stories in your re reading life? Actually, to be honest with you, it's just where I am in my, in my life right now. So yes, I am amassing a collection of books from Florida authors and I'm just doing a, a dive into it and just really, really enjoying it. But again, going back to my roots in television, a lot of the stuff that I've read in the past has to do with research or things, documentaries. There's so many things that I've worked on over the course of so many years, and reading is just part of the job. Mm -hmm. But I love it because I get so involved. I, I, I find out new things, and then I get so excited. So, I mean, part of me loves that nonfiction thing of learning and uncovering some hidden story that's true, that's, you know, wild. Um, but I've also enjoyed Heather Graham, like a little, <laughs> a little mm -hmm. romance novel, you know, crime things, James Patterson, things like that. But I think for the most part, where my life has led me is to read stuff mostly through work. There was another book that I, I read that really sticks in my mind. And un unfortunately, I don't have the book because it was the type of thing I checked out of the library. And I was doing a story on Martin Luther King and his experiences here in Florida. And I was interviewing John and Patricia Dew, who had a lot to do with civil rights back in the day. Patricia Dew being with Congress on Racial Equality. So she and her group in college were doing the sit-ins at the diners and things like that. And John Dew, and I think this is how they met, his his involvement with college was with NAACP. So the people were getting arrested with the sit-ins. NAACP, because he was a pre-law student, was helping to get these people out of jail. That's actually how they met. So I pick up the book uh, written by Patricia Dew and her daughter, Tanana Reeve Dew, who was a writer for our you know, newspaper here, the Miami Herald. And what was so cool about that book, each chapter was one from the daughter, one from the mother, one from the daughter, oh. one from the mother. And it was about their life growing up in this, in this culture from the mother's point of view at the height of the civil rights movement to Tanana Reeves experiences. And again, I love looking at the craft of how a writer puts it together that's what I really loved about Kent Russell's book as well, because I told you it was like three different themes in one book. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was a fascinating book to look at one generation and then another generation. It was just so clever. I love stuff like that. Mia, what are you reading these days? Are you reading for pleasure right now or are you reading for research for your work? I'm I'm about to embark on a 
no, I'm not about to. I am embarking on a on a big project with a with a local historian here, um, an author who has just written a book, or it's going to come out. Miami is about to turn 125 years old. The anniversary is July 28th. That's the day that Miami was incorporated back in 1896, and the you know. For your listeners that may not know Miami history, but if you were to Google it in two seconds on the Internet, it's going to tell you that Julia Tuttle is the mother of Miami. And she's the only woman to ever found a major American city. Well, um, Caesar Becerra is going to turn history on its head because he's making the case for Mary Brickle who he believes is one of the most marginalized women in history. They say that Julia Tuttle, after back-to-back freezes here uh, in the state of Florida, had sent orange blossoms because she'd been trying to entice railroad tycoon Henry Flagler to extend his railroad from St. Augustine down into Miami. So after back-to-back freezes, and I think Henry Flagler getting aggravated with her going, Julia, again, leave me alone. (laughs) She sends him orange blossom clippings to say, see, the freeze didn't affect us down here. I think you should bring your railroad down here. So Google it. You can find that story. His book is called Orange Blossom 2.0 because what he's doing is saying, reimagine the birth of Miami's history, but with Mary Brickle. Mary Brickle came here 20 years earlier than Julia Tuttle. Mary Brickle had more lands than Julia Tuttle. To get Flagler to come from St. Augustine to Miami, they needed to go to Brickle lands along the New River in Fort Lauderdale. So all this stuff about Mary Brickle, but you can hardly find her in history. So I'm totally attracted to that because here we're just we're just turning history on its head. I think, I think sometimes when, when history is being reported, it just gets researched. And if something's wrong in history, it just, it's just deemed to get repeated over and over and over and over again until you have somebody like Caesar who goes digging and he's been researching it for 25 years. And he's actually gone into, into the Brickles footsteps all the way back to Australia. He's actually journeyed back into their shoes, met their ancestors, everything, and has amassed this collection that's going to really confront this topic and put it out there. So my, so that's like a mission of ours now is to get Mary in the history books, in the classrooms even. So that's, that's kind of where I am right now. Um, so it, it, it's not, it's not so much for pleasure, but it is very pleasurable. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm going to read, read this, you know, crime novel to escape. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pleasurable because I have like an end game. Do you have a sense of why Mary Brickle was pushed aside? Yes. Julia Tuttle was very outspoken. She was the hobnobber. She was, she came here as a widow. I think she inherited her father's land here. Um, but, you know, she was the type to be out there, you know, within groups and within people. The Brickles pretty much kept to themselves. You know, Mary was a very savvy businesswoman. And but, you know, and there was a little rift between Flagler and the Brickles. And, and truthfully, Mary winds up taking over a lot of the business dealings. They think that William Brickle may have suffered some kind of um, mental disorder. I mean, none of that is really proven, but like, you know, like early signs of dementia or something like that. So even though they were they were together in doing business. It was, you know, you can see Mary's signature on all these documents. She kind of, you know, she she was really the spearhead behind everything. But they came here 20 years earlier they were on the south bank of the Miami River. They uh, they they built a trading post to trade with the Seminole Indians. Like they have more history here than Julia Tuttle did, and Julia Tuttle winds up, you know, I can't remember the exact dates, but she she winds up passing away not long after Miami's incorporation. So I feel like this short lived period of Julia Tuttle, and yet she's got all the 
she's got all the notoriety or, you know, all the all the recognition rather. Well, I can't wait to hear what you do with this. This is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be it's going to be exciting. Um, He's also offering this 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 uh, time capsule. It's a crate. It's called, you know, it's it's and it's got authentic Miami memorabilia within the crate. It's like a living time capsule right now. So that's like but Sarah is doing that. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. It's, it, okay. Y- yeah. It's a it's a whole it's a whole event thing that we're leading up to to Miami's 125th anniversary. So I'm kind of immersed in that, and and yeah. it's it's fun. It promotes Florida, and it gives it that little like dig in the side. Like, no, Miami Miami history wasn't quite, you know, what you thought it was. Now, let me ask you, how do you battle the crocodiles? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I ask that is because there was a lot of crocodile talk in this book, and I've only been to Florida once. I stayed in Port St. Lucie. My husband was on a business trip, and at the time, my son was an infant, and I would just drive around during the day and look for manatees. And <laughs> I went to visit my husband at the office where he was working that week, and there was a little sort of like a pond behind the office, and I was standing there holding my baby and looking into the water and going, oh, look at the little fishies, and you know what you do with babies. And then this man came up to me and said, you need to back up. (laughs) (laughs) And there was a sign that said, you know, you could die from crocodiles. And I've always had this sense of, you know, at any time in Florida, something could could just jump out and seize your leg. Yeah, I mean, kind of. um, I know they've eaten little dogs and stuff, but... We are, I don't know what the statistic is, but you keep saying crocodile. We, we're one state that has crocodile and alligator. So oh, you're we're, so- <laughs> yeah, we're actually both. But, you know, if you go down to the Everglades or so, you, you just see them walk by. They just lumber on by. I've seen them walk across golf courses, you know, huge ones. You just, you just let them go about your way. Oh my um, God, that's bananas. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 really funny to watch because you look like you're almost watching some leftover prehistoric creature and it just lumbers away because they get really, really big. I'll tell you what's crazy here, like just like living here in my house, in my neighborhood, in my backyard. It's not just alligators. We have these gigantic, ugly iguanas and they'll <laughs> scurry across the roof of my house because I used to have the before we cut it down, there used to be a tree that used to hang over the roof of the house and it, you know, we're so hurricane prone. I had to cut that yeah. back. But they would jump from the tree limb, ba boom, on your house and scurry. I, it, that sounds terrifying. They like crawl up the light poles and 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 um, it's. And I said to myself, you know, growing up, I remember seeing lizards. I remember seeing lots of little lizards. I'm like, when did the lizards get to be gigantic? I, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Unless as a kid, you're not paying attention. You know, you're just running around, riding your bike, skinning your knees, doing whatever. But uh, yeah, it is It is insane. But it is after you've seen an alligator, you can safely say, okay, that's it. That's 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 my Florida calling card right there, the alligator. Yeah. And, and, and we, I, you know, part of the problem is that we have built so much and we built so far out West and we just, we're actually in their territory. We, Mm -hmm. we are living in their backyard. Let's face it. I know there are people who make a business here out of capturing them or uh, relocating them. I don't know where they're relocating them to, but it's a whole business down here. Since reading this book, I have such a sense of the state as there's such an individualism there that despite all of these things that are telling you not to live there, like the hurricanes and the gigantic reptiles <laughs> <laughs> and the heat and the mosquitoes, most rational people will go, this is not a great place to live. And that was the great thing about this book is you get a sense of a population that goes, God damn it, I do what I want. Yeah. And 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 now that you're mentioning that it that way, you can certainly have a deep appreciation for the people who did build up Florida because you literally built it on top of a swamp like Carl Fisher, who builds Miami Beach. It's like 
you know, and this humongous bridge from the mainland over to the bay. How impossible does that seem? It's <laughs> it's amazing. So you have to have this dream and then you have to make that dream a reality. And some people who have come here have gone bankrupt trying to make that dream come true. So it, it's it's truly amazing. And another thing I love about Florida that I've that I've interviewed people it does give you a sense of place for people that may have moved around a lot. You know, they, they, they can come to South Florida and realize that a lot of people are in the same boat here and they can create their own. They feel more at home because within their own community and their own people, we have little Haiti, we have little Havana here. We have Kyocho. We have like all these different places and cultures that can make you feel home, even though you're not in your original homeland. But I, I, I love this state. I will always love the state. I mean, I kind of like Kent Russell says he loves and loathes the state <laughs> kind of feel the same way. You have the love hate relationship going on. Why don't you share um, where my listeners can find your work and your wonderful podcast, which I delight in. Um, okay. Yes. You I'm on every major platform, wherever you get your podcast, you can listen to the so flow weird show. Or you can go straight to my website at soflowweird.com, where I've got other interesting Florida stories. You can look at all kinds of stuff on there. Um, if you want to find us on social media, you can search at soflowweird. We have a SoFlow Weirdos Facebook group, and we share stories every every other day about Florida. Mia, I want to thank you for introducing me to this book. It was so fun to read. And I want to thank you for joining me today. It's just been a delight talking to you. Julie, thank you so much. You're a great conversationalist too. Thanks for listening, bookworms. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at bestbookeverpodcast. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie wrote a book. Remember, whenever you are book shopping, help support indie bookstores and this podcast by using my affiliate link at bookshop.org slash best book ever. Bookshop's mission is to support local independent bookstores. And if you shop using my link, I'll get a small percentage of your purchase at no extra expense to you. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.